Hello again. What's everyone watching these days? I just thought it might be interesting to share with you my latest DVD and Blu-ray haul. I still love DVDs and Blu-rays. I love solid media. I can't get into streaming. And I like the, the fact that you own the film, you have all these extras with it. It's a labour of love by the DVD company. So I still believe in DVDs. And uh, my first purchase uh, to talk about is The North Water. This is a salty tale of the sea. I love stories of the sea. I love maritime adventures. I love the idea of this, this group of sailors on a ship being a microcosm of society. This is a particularly good maritime adventure, actually. Um, it's a BBC production from last year. It stars Jack O'Connell, who's from my mum's neck of the woods in Derbyshire, and uh, Colin Farrell. And it's about a, uh, a young doctor, a surgeon on board a ship, who uh, finds that there's, they're up to no good on the ship. It's a working class whaling vessel out of Hull, which is an unusual setting, and I quite like that about it. And he finds out that the captain is trying to scuttle his own vessel, and there's also a fiend on board who would rape and kill a cabin boy, and he finds himself fighting for his life to uh, uncover the murderer. It's good fun. It's beautifully produced, very well directed by Andrew Haig, a Nottinghamshire born director who made a very good film called 45 Years with Tom Courtney and Charlotte Rampling. If you've never seen that, it's well worth checking out. And this is a really good uh, period production. It was filmed on location in Svalbard in Norway. The landscapes are, are really striking. Um, it's, it's well worth watching. Then I've got Conrad Veidt in The Spy in Black, a jolly good 1940 British spy adventure. It was the first collaboration of Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger. And um, the reason I bought it is because um, I've just finished a retrospect of Akira Starmi's, uh, Abbas Kiarostami's films, which I'll be doing a video about next week. And now I'm going to start doing a, a retrospective of Michael Powell. So I've got this. I also managed to find the other Conrad Veidt spy adventure they made, Contraband, uh, sometimes known as Blackout. I found that uh, through other means on the internet, shall we say. But uh, yes, I'm looking forward to watching that one again. Then I've got this beautiful, beautiful thing. This new package from Indicator, an excellent British label, The Swimmer, starring Burt Lancaster. Uh, Burt Lancaster wears a pair of swimming trunks and nothing else for the entire movie. And he's a businessman who swims home through the swimming pools of his rich and wealthy neighbours. And it's, a, it's an allegory. That's what it is. It's a metaphor. But um, it's one of those films that sort of it's on the tightrope between being ridiculous and brilliant, and it just manages to stay this side of brilliant. And it will haunt you for days after you've seen it. Um, it's based on a story by John Cheever. Unfortunately, that story is not featured in this rather large package, which is a bit of an omission. They do have a, a, a big article comparing the story with the film, though. Perhaps they couldn't get the copyright. Um, but there is a very detailed analysis of the troubled production of this film, and by God it was troubled. If you're a lover of cult Americana and cult movies, this is an absolute must. It's been a favourite film of mine for the longest time. Next up, Sex, Lies and Videotape. My sister took me to see this when I was about 15. She used to come over from Nottingham and pick me up and take me to the cinema. And we saw this movie. We were not prepared for it, I can tell you. Um, it was this very adult film uh, in which a man who is impotent films his friends and, has, and makes them talk about their sex lives in order to achieve arousal. Uh, it was the first major film of Steven Soderbergh. And at the time, it seemed so important. It was like a bomb going off. Me and my sister had never seen anything so adult, so uh, provocative. Now, no one talks about it. And yes, that is Andy McDowell on the front. This was her first big movie as an actress, and everyone thought she was going to be a great actress. There were strange times in the 1980s. It also featured a young James Spader, who was brilliant in the movie. I'm quite intrigued to see what I make of it after all these years, so I'm looking forward to putting it on the DVD player again. Next up, Win Stanley. This is a very interesting movie. It was made by two British documentarians, Kevin Brownlow and Andrew Mollo, about the Digger movement, a sort of proto-socialist movement, if you like, that uh, occurred during the English Civil War. I'm fascinated by the English Civil War in that period. 
It's a period that the English tend to ignore or push aside. One of the most bloody and important moments in our history, but we don't really talk about it very much. Um, and so any recreation of that period is interesting to me. Talking about recreation, Kevin Brown and Andrew Mollo did such amazing research on their movies that they actually went to the lengths of finding the right pigs that were farmed at the time. Because animals have been crossbred, you know, over the years, the, the breeds of animals you get in farms now are nothing like what they were in the 1600s. They actually went to the trouble of finding the right pigs, the kind of pigs, the bacon that you'd have got back in those days. That's how well researched this film is. It's a very interesting little piece. Next up, The Souvenir Part 2, the second part of Joanna Hogg's uh, autobiographical, slightly indulgent, uh, portrayal of her life during the 1980s when she was a film student trying to get a film made and her uh, rather awkward relationship with a posh, aristocratic, enigmatic older man. This second part I actually think is superior to the first part, although the ending is rather indulgent, I think. It's... Um, Joanna Hogg's most accessible film up to this point, which is also a way of saying it's her most straightforward, um, but it is worth watching if you've not seen it. <clears throat> For lovers of fairy tale cinema, and I'm one of them, and I will be doing a uh, video about fairy tale films soon, here is a little known version of Beauty and the Beast. Now, most of us would admit that Jean Cocteau's version from the 40s is probably the best version of this story. Um, and most people know the Disney version, of course. Uh, I would argue that this is an equal of those films. Um, it's a very different film. It's a, it's a much darker version of Beauty and the Beast, but with a very, very syrupy, romantic score, which I happen to like. Um, I think it's a beautiful movie, this. Um, it, it, gets, it, it gets that sense of eeriness and also that sense of fantasy and adolescent indulgence that is the hallmark of the fairy tale. And it's well worth discovering if you've never seen it before. And finally, we have two movies by a Japanese director called Tomo Uchida from the classic era of Japanese film. I've only just, discard, uh, just started to discover his films myself, actually, through Arrow films. First of all, Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji, um, which was a comeback film for him. He'd been out of favour during the war, he'd been working in China. He came back with this masterpiece. Um, it's a kind of uh, very fresh, unusual road movie for samurais. Um, I'm still not quite sure what I make of it, but it's interesting. But this movie, The Mad Fox, which followed it, is a, a masterpiece. It's a, a jeu d'esprit of artificiality, theatricality, um, mixing up Bunraku theatre with, uh, you know, eye-popping colours and scenery. It's, it's a one-off. And it's about a young guy who, the love of his life is killed in a plot. And he goes mad. And these fox people, these weir people of, of Japanese uh, folklore, come to his aid. Um, you'll never have seen anything like this. It really is very special indeed. So that's my DVD haul. Um, let me know what you've been buying lately and what you, what you recommend, and I'll see you later.